Today's video on cross-stitch pattern design is brought to you by the ridiculous Eurovision dress I sewed last year. It'll make sense in a minute. I promise. Back in 2021, as one of my first ever videos, I made a behind the scenes of my cross stitch pattern design process that did surprisingly well given the overall shocking quality. <laughs> Since then, I've had quite a few requests for an updated version with less cringy attempts at humour and more actual useful information. So, given that I spent the majority of the last couple weeks working on this ridiculous niche Eurovision design that nobody except for me will ever want to stitch, this seems like as good a time as any. Let's take a look at how my design process has changed over the years and also a few ways that it's stayed the same. And I'll put timestamps down in the description, so if you're just interested in something really specific, feel free to skip around. Okay, so back in the day I said the first step of the design process was always inspiration and picking a theme, and that is totally still true. In this particular case, I was walking along the outskirts of our local forest, listening to a playlist of all the Eurovision 2024 songs released so far, when I realised what I must do. Finland's entry is a thing of beauty. It made me so happy when it won their national selection, and it's just a banger to listen to on a walk. I knew I absolutely had to pay cross-stitch tribute to this masterpiece. So next I thought about some constraints, because constraints actually help creativity, which is the exact opposite to what you might expect, but there we go. I knew I wanted it to be a quick stitch because I wanted to publish it quite quickly to coincide with the end of national final season and fill in the Eurovision lull. So I kept it small on purpose, 6 inches maximum on 14 count fabric. No full coverage. I knew it needed to have Finland blue in there somewhere, it definitely needed to shout NO RULES! And of course, those shorts had to be in there somewhere. You might think a design based on an act called Windows 95 Man, where one of the performers is dressed in all kinds of Windows 95 merch, should maybe feature the Windows 95 logo somewhere. But when I was designing this, it seemed like he was going to have to change the name to obey Eurovision rules on product advertising. He's since been given permission to keep the name, but the logo still won't fly. So since we don't really know what mad thing he'll end up wearing on the day, I figured it was safest just to stick with a general retro computing vibe rather than anything too specific. Yes, I do take my weird Eurovision fan art very seriously. Thank you for noticing. In the older version of this video, I used Photoshop to design and to grid out my pattern. These days, I actually still do use it for the design part, but not for making the final grid, which we'll talk about in a bit. I create a tiny canvas, in this case 84 pixels square, which is my 6 inches multiplied by 14 count fabric, turn on a 1 pixel grid, and I use the pencil tool on the smallest possible radius to draw 1 pixel at a time. Now this is, objectively, not the best way to draw pixel art. By a long shot. But because I've been using Photoshop for so long, it's just what comes naturally to me. I've tried other more specialist tools, including quite a lot of cross-stitch specific ones, and honestly, I just find a lot of them quite clunky and more limited, whereas in Photoshop, I can just do whatever I want. One thing I do want to look at is a tool called A-Sprite, which is massively popular among pixel artists designing for games. And as you may know, I'm also a hobbyist game dev, so learning to use that may be a case of two birds, one stone. Or maybe not, and I'll toddle back to Photoshop. Who knows? I will test that soon though, and let me know if you'd care to see a review of its suitability for cross-stitch. I could totally make a video on that. Ultimately though, cross-stitch is pixel art, so whatever lets you create pixel art in a way that works for you, do that! Now obviously this is a small pattern and it didn't take a huge amount of designing. The text is actually a very, very slightly modified version of the original Windows 95 font, and I used reference photos to draw out what I think is a pretty decent representation of those awful cut-off shots. At first I wasn't really sure how to turn this into a more obviously retro computer theme, but the idea of using the shorts as a button icon hit pretty early and I just ran with it. The arrow cursor gives you a bit more context, but without being too big and unbalancing the otherwise centred design. And finally, I changed the outline of the shorts to grey to give them a bit more contrast against the button background. Thank you, hangers out in my Discord. With the design complete, it was time to start stitching. But, um, in order to start stitching, you kind of need to know what colours you're using. 
Now over the years I have tried downloading pre-made colour palettes to represent the DMC shades, or making my own to represent just the ones that I already own, but the problem is you're just never going to get a good representation with flat colours. Embroidery floss is shiny and textured, cross stitches tend to be made up of multiple strands, and of course they often show a bit of the fabric through as well, so two shades that look like they have great contrast on your computer screen may look basically identical when you see them stitched up. This is why I still try and physically stitch up my designs, and this is also why you can often find me standing at my floss shelf or down at boys looking for that elusive shade. With this one, colour choices were pretty simple. These warm greys scream old computers to me, and of course I wanted to find an accurate as possible Finland blue for the darkest tone. Luckily, I just happened to own a five foot Finland flag, because it's important to have a flag on Eurovision night. <laughs> and yeah, over the years between the two of us we have supported quite a few different countries. <laughs> anyway, the other blues could just follow on from there, and that was that. Sometimes I will start stitching a sample piece and I'll realise that a colour I'd picked just isn't working. That's part of the process and it's really important to get the colours right, so having to frog stitches and redo them in a very slightly, imperceptibly different shade is always something I'm prepared for. Happily, on this occasion, maybe I'm getting a bit better at this or maybe it's just the simplicity of the design, but my choices worked out brilliant first time. When stitching a sample, I'll start with half stitches only, just because it's easier to frog in the event something is the wrong colour, or if I've made a mistake with my spacing, or whatever. And in this case, my main worry was how this would fit into a round hoop. I didn't want it to look cramped vertically, so I stitched kind of a line down the middle to make sure everything was going to fit. That's much better than stitching all of that text before realising it's in the wrong place, you know? And this one isn't necessarily a super important step, but it is fun to post the first inscrutable section and get people guessing what on earth it's going to be. Shout out to everyone on Cross Stitch Lemmy who at least recognised it was going to become pants. Because this is just a freebie, I was stitching it up mainly outside of work hours, i.e. in the evening when the light was atrocious, so I don't have any particularly great footage of this and also my eyes hurt. But you get the idea. Stitching this up did help me realise I'd only left one space between the R and the U, as opposed to two spaces between all the other letters, so this is the sort of thing you just often don't see until you physically go to do it yourself. Seriously, this part of the process is invaluable. I'd also counted wrong and finished up my L one stitch early, so after I'd blocked out the E and the S in half stitches, I actually had to take them back out and shift everything over by one stitch. But at least it was only half stitches and not full, right? Now, this is the part in the old version of my system where I would use a very manual process to create my pattern grids in Photoshop. And it worked fine for small patterns like this, but it did have one major drawback. It meant that the final grid in the pattern PDF was essentially one big image. And you know what can't read a grid if it's just one big image? Pattern Keeper, and anything else that works the same way. Now, a lot of stitchers don't use Pattern Keeper, and a lot of designers probably don't care at all about compatibility with it. I have had quite a few people in the comments on my old video asking for more detail about what exactly I was doing in Photoshop, so I'm going to quickly go through my old manual process now, just for those people, and then we'll get on to how I'm doing it these days. I had these pre-prepared transparent grid graphics in various sizes, each square in this grid being 21 pixels, which I honestly can't remember why I settled on 21, your mileage may vary there. So I would take my pixel art and scale the whole thing up by 21, which means when I add the grid graphic over the top it fits perfectly. Now the clever part. Years ago I drew out a load of basic icons to use in my grids, and what I would do is use colour select to choose just the area of the image that is, say, dark blue. Duplicate it, so now dark blue is on its own layer. In layer styles, turn off the fill colour and replace it with a pattern of one of my pre-made icons. Do this for every colour in the pattern, slap that transparent grid over the top, and Bob's your uncle. Of course, if you prefer colour patterns, you can simply turn that base layer back on and adjust the transparency until you're happy. This probably sounds like a lot of work, and honestly, yeah, it would have been if I'd decided to try scaling up and doing bigger patterns. But I had the system down, it was really quick, it worked a treat for me, honestly, apart from that pesky pattern keeper thing. Okay, so that's what I was doing, what am I doing now? We've established that Pattern Keeper support is important to me, so I did a lot of research into how independent designers like myself could make compatible PDFs without the super, super expensive software. 
At the time of the previous video, the best answer I could find was basically that you could maybe use software like WinStitch or PC Stitch, export your pattern with very, very specific settings and cross your fingers. I found this to be very patchy at best. Sometimes it just wouldn't work at all. Sometimes Pattern Keeper would only recognize some of the symbols and PC Stitch support confirmed to me in writing that this wasn't an officially supported feature and they wouldn't be able to help. Luckily, since then, with the continued growth of Pattern Keeper and similar apps, WinStitch have got very much on board. They've added a specific Pattern Keeper export that just works. I actually bought the full software just literally for this one feature and it's been so worth it. But that still leaves the question of how to get our pattern from basic pixel art into WinStitch in the first place. <sighs> I have talked to a few of you in the comments of that old video over the years and I know my struggles with this are not just me. <laughs> Basically, WinStitch does come with an import tool, but the problem is the exact best settings seem to vary a bit depending on the specific art you're using, so you do kind of have to accept a bit of trial and error in this process sometimes. There's also the fact that if I try and import something twice in a row, the whole thing will crash, so I have to shut it down and open it again in between attempts. Remember what I said earlier about cross-stitch software being clunky? <laughs> For example then, if I use the image import wizard with this design, it'll specifically tell me that I will have better results using the newer advanced import wizard. And sometimes that's true, sometimes it's not. In this case, the advanced one has invented a new colour here, and while that's easily fixed in our particular case, it's sometimes a lot worse than this. If I go back to the old import wizard and I choose the clip art option, let's see... Usually this gives me better results, but you could never be too sure. There we go. Much better. Not that it's always flawless. I've had it randomly decide that one of the colours was actually background and should be replaced with whatever the fabric colour is, and then it wouldn't let me undo that assumption. Just all kinds of weird random things that just seem to happen sometimes. But once I do get that nice clean import, I can basically breathe a sigh of relief because we're pretty much there. There are two main ways to handle colours. As you can see, if you just import it without specifying anything, it'll essentially guess at which floss colours best represent the artwork, which it's not great at. You can then go in and edit each one manually to replace it with the actual final colour. Or, if you are using the advanced import wizard, you can tell it exactly which colours to use in advance. Once you're imported, you can see how the chart is going to look, you can change any of the symbols you want or whatever else, and then it's export time. The Pattern Keeper export has very little to it. I just add an optional PDF cover page I've made that is very simple and does not look great, but it works. It'll export your pattern in black and white, which is the format Pattern Keeper prefers, and you're done. I do also export a colour version for people who aren't using Pattern Keeper, so I can once again add that cover page and tell it I'd like the colour chart format and whatever other settings. It only takes about 30 extra seconds to make two files instead of one, and I figure it covers a lot more bases for the people who might one day end up stitching it. Now, obviously, I glossed over the creation of a cover page there, because that can really be anything you want, and also it's entirely optional, you don't even need one. I have a template I set up in InDesign years ago, but you could easily use something free like Canva. My template does feature a photo of the finished piece, so it means I need to do my photography session before I can create the cover page. Again though, this is just going to depend on your workflow. Everyone's going to have a slightly different order of events. Occasionally, after looking at the photos for a bit, I'll realise I wish I'd changed something. The spacing between lines of text and between the button here is the same, but actually I kind of wish I'd moved the button down one. I'm also second guessing whether there should be another colour in here to give that button more definition. Now for my own sample stitch, I'll probably just leave these things because I don't really care, but I think I will include them in the pattern. Very basic but infinitely useful Photoshop skills, once again to the rescue. Then there's the admin of writing up a description, uploading everything to the coffee shop, having a moment of panic about whether I actually did set something to members only or not, and finally, at long last, that pattern is published. Time for a cup of tea. And yes, by the way, this pattern is actually published. You can grab it for free at the link down in the description. You know, if you happen to be a really big Eurovision nerd who particularly likes Finland this year and also cross stitches. Real big target market for this pattern. <laughs> All that remains is to decide whether I'm brave enough to post about it on socials or whether, as per usual, I will chicken out and rely on Kofi's automated emails to tell people. I'm working on this part, okay? So, closing thoughts. 
You might be wondering why, if I'm importing into WinStitch anywhere, I don't just design in there in the first place. And honestly, all I can tell you is I hate working in it. It's so much slower for me personally because I'm just so used to Photoshop. So I use what works for me. But that doesn't mean there's necessarily anything wrong with designing in WinStitch. They do a free trial, download it, give it a whirl. It might be perfect for you. The vast majority of the time I spend on any given pattern is stitching it because I'm really not a fast cross stitcher at all. But I do think it's worth it, not only because you get much better photos in the end, but also just for the peace of mind that it gives me. That said, if you are 100% confident in your colour choices and you're much better at spotting mistakes than I am, you might choose to skip this part in favour of putting out more patterns instead. You do you, I am not gonna judge. And finally, if you do peek at my pattern shop, you might find it to be a bit of a, let's say a hodgepodge of different design styles. <laughs> All I can say there is that I'm not a natural artist and one of my goals at the minute is to find my design style. So the best way to do that is to just try everything I can think of and see what sticks. Doesn't make for the most coherent shop grid, but what can I say? I'm a mess. All right, I hope this answered any questions that you might have had from the previous video, and if not, let me know down in the comments and I'll do my best to answer there. Thank you, as always, to my wonderful Ko-fi supporters for making this and all of my other videos possible, and if you are one of the people who sent a bit of extra help to get me that Lowry stand extension after my recent video, you are amazing. Thank you, and you'll see that pop up in videos pretty soon. Special shout outs to my Stitch Squad. Marianne Johnson. Sunny. Candy Riley Peddinger, Laura Salatz, Rosalie, Enlightened Flamingo, Cross Stitch the Globe, I'd Rather Be Stitching, and Angela Sue Harrison. We've just started doing an extra bonus video each week for Stitch Squad members and above, so if that sounds interesting to you, hop over to the Kofi page and give it a look. Okay, that's enough sleazy self promo. I'll be back soon with some more crafty nonsense, so in the meantime, have a brilliant rest of your day and keep making cool stuff. Bye!